This is the second independent half of a conversation with Mark Benecki. Mark is a forensic entomologist, the sort of researcher who investigates the way that insects colonize bodies at a crime scene. You might have heard recently that insect populations have dropped by as much as 80% in certain parts of Europe, but that records elsewhere are spotty. Because Mark works all over the world, in this conversation, I wanted to find out, at least anecdotally, if he had also seen a drop in insect populations at crime scenes. It turns out, rather disturbingly, that at crime scenes, certain species of insects have disappeared almost entirely. We also discuss psychopaths, the Epstein trial, and the newest forensic techniques. I hope you enjoy. Escaped sapiens. Uh, one, one of the things I'm interested in is... Um, you know, I, 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 one of my first uh, guests that I interviewed was Dave Goulson. He's an uh, entomologist. And we discussed uh, there's this huge crash in uh, w what seems to be a crash in insect populations somewhere up to 80% uh, in the last decades, let's say, in some locations. And one of the problems they have there is just a lack of uh, data. You know, the, no, no one's keeping these records. But uh, when it comes to your work, you know, you look specifically at the way that bodies decompose and the way that uh, insects colonize bodies. And this is research that I suppose has been going on for decades. And so one of the questions I have is when you look specifically at body farms and when you look at specifically at the work you're doing, are you seeing this drop in insect populations? Are you, are you seeing a change in morphology? Are you seeing a uh, change in the numbers of insects? Are you, you know, are bodies taking longer to decompose now? You know, uh, is this an, an area where you have the data where we can actually get a handle on what's happening? Yeah, uh, concerning the data, especially from Germany, Krefeld, this was the study that was relating to the 75% decrease. I was the representative for the study at the Congress of Dipterologists. That really exists. Every two years, there's a Congress of Dipterologists, of fly experts. And uh, in Namibia, and I was the person there to represent the, that study. And um, some people al also said there are not enough data there. But in the original study, there's a lot of data. If you um, if you really look at the study, you will be surprised because I did it. It's, they didn't do it in the study, but I did it. I counted how many days they measured. And these were many days. So that was number one. And number two is just very recently... The new study of the, from the same working group came out and they uh, come to the same result. Also, some other groups um, started to work uh, in, to, in the field because that was a huge shock, of course, at that point. So now we have very good data concerning the loss of arthropods, but also of amphibians. This is often forgotten. We are, we are on a planet in which everything dies, not only the insects, but also amphibians and uh, birds. Uh, that's it's it's unbelievable the amount of animals that died since uh, relating to your question uh, when it also comes to something that we can observe in nature in forensic cases i would say 2003 is um unspeakable un and not 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 in the sense of uh, emotions but in the sense of uh, numbers um it started 2003 when we saw that certain blowflies there are the shiny blue ones and the shiny uh, green ones that that are best known to everybody public and um one of them started to not approach the corpses anymore but instead wasps were coming which is not a problem i mean we do not know about the life cycle of wasps or i mean we do know everything about the life cycle but it's not relevant for criminalistic cases so um or at least in, in not uh, when it comes to the time since colonization for that, it is not important. For other things, yes, because they can mimic stab wounds and stuff like that. But so the wasps were coming and we we're like, what the hell? Because that was an area in which we had a lot of corpses over a long time at the University of Cologne. So we put out um, just uh, lumps of meat and observed strictly if this was an observation error or, you know, like something. And no... It was actually it was the wasps. The wasps were eating everything up. At the same time, the wasps are attacking the flies. But we were like, wait a second, this is one type of fly disappearing, and that's the fly that is usually well adapted to bright sunlight. So so one of them is more into the, the shades and the shadows and forest and, and bushes and shrubbery, and the other one is more into the bright open sunlight. And that the the sunlight loving Blowfly was was just not there. We're like, okay, that is tough. Probably it's too warm and too dry. 
because that was not an area where insecticides were used. Um, in contrast to many of the other studies, because um, close to natural reserves, you often have intensive agriculture. So often, even inside of a natural reserve, you have a lot of insecticides, but not in our case. This was in the middle of the city and uh, at the institute. So we were like, okay, it could still be a, an error because it happened just one year and so on. So I was talking to the guys who, uh, who kill insects professionally, And they were like, yeah, we don't care. We often have wasps and we don't know because they don't, like you said, they don't collect the data. So we were waiting and waiting because that was now quite a while ago. <laughs> oh, wow. This is 20 years. Yeah, this is roughly 20 years ago. And then we saw it coming. It was not so much the blowflies um, not approaching the areas due to dryness or extreme heat and so on, but it was the collapse of the, of the complete biological system. Um, it, it's like, let's say you have a very old washing machine and it dies. And then the mechanic guy comes and he's like, you know, everything is defective. You know, the rubber band is defective. The, the, <laughs> the motor is defective. The pump is defective. Really forget it. Just throw away the, the, the washing machine. And this, this is what happened to the ecosystems. We go out to areas where we just put out, um, some tiny corpses from the, from the veterinarian, you know, like a cancer, um, animals died of cancer and then they were killed and then we take them and put them out to see how decomposition goes and there were hardly any insects approaching them anymore and it's it's getting worse and worse and worse it's it's unbelievable um we we are out i'm not a field biologist in the strict sense so most of the plants for example i have no idea of but um, still, we see a lot because we hide our corpses or sometimes the corpses in actual cases are hidden somewhere and the nature just uh, died. It just died in front of our eyes. It, it's um, Younger people can't even relate to it anymore because they don't know the sounds. When we are talking about the birds, for example, they just don't know how it sounded um, 40 years ago. The sound of nature was so absolutely different. This is like... Um, Let's say <laughs> Rammstein wouldn't perform anymore. And you would try to explain people without a Blu-ray and without everything what a Rammstein concert was like. Nobody could imagine what it was like. There was smoke and fire and heat and sweat and people screaming and it was too loud. And, and it was just, you know, and you can't explain that. And nature was in a good sense like that. There was chirping and crawling and buzzing and things falling upon you and like scratching. <laughs> it was unbelievable. We know for sure that we are in the middle of total Armageddon. This is measured in every single species or group of group of animals that we know of. The worst amphibians and, and insects where the data are relatively good by now scientific and ma mathematically sound but also in other areas where you just can make rough estimates sometimes because let's say you look at um, let's say in africa uh, antelopes or something then you probably don't know how many antelopes were there like 100 years ago 200 years ago 300 years ago but um, from estimates even in in those areas everything is dying elephants that's a good example too elephants will just if you leave them in peace You will just have so many elephants, you know, they just breed and, and uh, spread. But um, even elephants are uh, endangered because the ecosphere is dying around them. The, the land is just not there anymore. The land is changing too much and all the natural resources that they need uh, are just dying. So we know for sure that this is happening. I've been to many conferences during the corona times, many online conferences that I could usually not attend. And I gave a lot of speeches also to super left-wing kids, uh, super conservative uh, persons who are interested in um, natural resources. And whenever I did show them the... the um, scientific papers from the last two or three years or the, the researchers did show them to me, we were all like totally stunned. We were like, in many cases, we were just like over Zoom, you know, like looking at each other when you know or when you have an idea where the other person might be. We were like, did you, did you just hear that? Did, did, do you just see the slide there? And then, you know, you just make a screenshot and it takes like a week until you understand what, what you really saw. Even for the researchers themselves, I've seen many researchers who presented their data and I was the one in the chat, in the Zoom chat, to tell them, did you ever publish that? And they're like, ah, yeah, well, I'm like, you must publish that. This is 
unbe an unbelievable loss of either diversity or species numbers. And then they're like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 it's true. Because they were focusing on something else. So even if you don't look, if you're not biased at all, if you're just like the la 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 biologist, you know, I like animals and plants and whatever. Even then you just randomly um, see what I'm, um, what I'm reporting here. And there are a lot of data out now. If you're interested, uh, or if you're readers uh, or, or viewers or, <laughs> or listeners, if, if you are interested, just look it up. And if you don't find it, The Guardian is always a good source. The, in the United Kingdom, The Guardian, the newspaper, they always report the latest scientific findings concerning that. I, I will definitely put this down in the description uh, of, of both the video and the audio. I, but are you publishing on this? Because, you know, this is, this is the question, uh, you know, Okay, in Germany, there, there've, there's a lot of data because people, there are these groups that have been looking at uh, this issue over the past decades. But if you go to Colombia and all these other places where, where you are, um, there may not be these other groups doing this. So I was, I was, I was wondering, you know, are you seeing a, a change when you're investigating uh, murders, for example? Uh, in, do you have to take this into account? Are you taking this into account? And, and is this something that uh, people in your line of work are publishing and holding up the flag and saying, you know, this is a problem? <laughs> Yeah, yes, and then no. Uh, yes, I do publish a lot because I give the speeches. If you want to, you can. I have a, I have a, a whole YouTube channel, a YouTube channel only relating to that matter with my latest speeches on that. And you know, at the Museum for Natural History in some city, or you know, when where not many people went, or at the public library there and there, or at the scientific congress there and there, where only 200 people came due to Corona and so on. So you can, if you want to, you can put that in the description mm -hmm. I because will. I have a whole channel on um, environment mental problems where I report these things I personally cannot um, can, can I report ask, is that anything just in German if that's only in German no right? no also English also English English and German uh, depending on where the Congress was or if the audience would uh, speak English or not um, but in crime cases I I don't want to um, do that because statistically speaking or mathematically speaking um, that would be too much of a bias because the cases that you are called to or called into are always chosen for a particular reason and one of the reasons could for example be um, it's inside of a city and somebody smelled something whereas if it happened in the forest somebody smelled something or uh, just much later for example by looking for mushrooms somebody found it and then you will always have the bias towards autumn because in autumn people are looking for mushrooms so you will always have autumn corpses and um, also the 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 number of measurements is not high enough because you could have a corpse in the one room where the person closes all windows you have a very stuffy environment you know like humid very strong smells a lot of trash um, and the decomposing body and everything soaked into the sofa, which also gives a microenvironment. You could have dermistid beetles who are starting to eat the sofa then because for them it becomes interesting when blood and feces and urine and decompositional fluid soak into it. Whereas next door, you could have a clean apartment where somebody died, the windows were open, no trash, etc. And then you would get uh, different uh, animals there. So mm -hmm. what, I, what we do is we publish the cases the single cases, but um, I think this is not suitable for an environmental approach, uh, statistically spoken, because it's just not enough cases. That's really unfortunate because this. I was hoping that this would be an area where we could actually pull out some information that's just not present otherwise. Well, but you can tell that certain uh, blowfly species are just missing that have been there before. So I can, I mean, this is still kind of anecdotal if you want. But to me, being a criminalist, which means I have to work with single cases. So I cannot always work statistically because if you have just one case with one particular set of environmental conditions and you cannot do as many experiments as you wanted, uh, then I'm used to like deciding if even an anecdotal observation is of relevance. And this is of relevance because since 2003, our blowflies are just, um, you know, it's just as if they were struck by thunder. They, they're just in during summertime, they just don't exist anymore. And also the biodiversity goes down. We can see that. It's just that I don't want to put it in, in uh, statistical or mathematical numbers. But mm. I, I do see that this happens and you can even see it in the jars. So if you look into the jars, 
when we take all animals let's say you're in the jungle in peru or somewhere then i just take you know like a bottle of rum and put all the insects from the corpse in there and you can you can see that it's just getting less and less and less insects this is something i um I pointed out to Dave Goulson, who's the other guest, the entomologist who I uh, interviewed, I pointed out that this is something that I had sort of noticed myself because when I, when I was a child, my grandfather was a sheep farmer. And so I would drive along in his truck and his truck would just be covered in mostly grasshoppers. <laughs> and, um, and this might be because we were out in the countryside, but it's just something I don't... When I drive around with my father, for example, when I'm back in Australia... I don't, the car is not covered in insects. So it's, it's something that you can actually see uh, even in, in my life lifetime uh, has, the biodiversity seems to have dropped uh, substantially even to my own eyes. Yeah, I totally agree. And the reason is, especially when it comes to grasshoppers and, you know, all like types of insects that you probably saw when you're just laying in the grassland romantically looking into the stars or probably during daytime because there are more insects out. Um, that, that really... Um, measurably um, cracked down and the reason seems to be that is the latest evidence from 2021 really seems to be uh, insecticides just insecticides because there was a lot of we, we really had no idea is it mostly dryness is it mostly deforestation and so on and so on and uh, but now it seems to be that it's intensive agriculture and the warming up of the planet so these two as we speak in December 2021, seem to be the main drivers. And that obviously also happens in Australia and everywhere on, on the planet. If we jump back into what you're working on uh, specifically, something you said caught my <laughs> my attention because, so you mentioned this case with the dildo where, where you were able to do cell samples and you could, so I, I knew previously that you could do DNA analysis and, and see that this came from this person and so on. I, I'd never thought about the fact that you could actually tell where on the body uh, cells came from. That it's just something that I had never thought about before what's what's the current state of the art like what what are you know if you go back you know some time fingerprints were the were brand new and the amazing thing that people were doing then dna at some point came in i guess last century what, what what's what's going on today that sort of state of the art that um, people might not know of um i can also send you uh, two new articles of mine that are a little bit relating to that matter in dna wise um that just came out the, the one came just out today <laughs> um Uh, with crime cases in which we a little bit talk uh, about that or I talk about that. Um, so I will just make it brief. The one thing that I like very much is that if you look microscopically, which most people don't do, like I'm, like I said, you can cut out with a laser, you can cut out the single cells from the, let's say the microscopic glass slide. And there's, there's a very thin layer on top, of course. And then the cells are embedded in it and you can stain them or you cannot stain them before that. You can take photographs, etc. And then you cut with a laser, um, you cut out the cell and then another laser shoots the cell into a sterile reaction tube, which performs, everybody knows now the term PCR. So you can do a, a genetic fingerprint uh, by a PCR. So that is something that is very nice because uh, the contamination level is very low because you just have a laser and the sterile DNA a free um, reaction tube so that's that's something that i like a lot another thing is familial dna that means you do super big data um, i saw it this year at the american academy of forensic sciences congress which was online this uh, this year 2021 and one of my colleagues who did a big case with familial dna really showed she's super nerdy too um, very boring talk, not for me, but I think for many other people. She showed with how, how she did the big data when she looked into population databases that were freely established by um, companies where you can um, check for your relatives all over the world and where you originally came from and so on. So you can check where do I come from over the past 50 or 100 years, 1000 years, or even 10,000 years and so on. And many of these people uh, um, allow free use of those data because you have to compare them to something, obviously. Um, those companies also buy family trees. They bought hundreds, no, 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 
they bought millions, millions of data uh, about fam real family trees from church books, you know, where it's written with ink uh, or from the arrival at um, Manhattan or anywhere on planet Earth. When people arrive, they bought all that. And this is all absolutely big data. And she's working now on the relation on, on the similarities between um, some of those DNA data to stains of unknown offenders. So that's a big thing that is coming up now and it works very well. Of course, you need a judge to allow that. You just cannot go there and do that like in a comic book um, without a juridical back backup. But this is, uh, that works per very well. It, this is really, really, really cool because you also um, can put in time and space because once you know a person who might be a relative and you work your way towards the person who has then the actual DNA profile, not just parts of it, then you could ask, okay, when have you seen your cousin last time? Um, did your cousin um, out, all of a sudden move to a place and didn't tell you where he moved to or something? So you can do uh, classical criminalistics on the police side with those data. So that is something that is quite beautifully then also... Can, can, I, can I just ask, um, sorry, before you, so just so I understand uh, exactly what you mean. So there's a crime scene and you get some DNA evidence and without having to uh, have a suspect, you have this huge database and you can pinpoint that, that piece of DNA somewhere within the database and say, this person is related to these 100 people over here. And then you can start narrowing down from that. That's pretty awesome. The, but the, And, and but that that's ter that's terrifying, <laughs> but also awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you that's why you need a judge to allow it. So, but I mean, the thing is, it's very difficult to abuse because uh, you know, especially in Germany, due to the uh, many <laughs> secret services that we had <laughs> in the past 100 years here, and um, the the violations of personal space and everything else. Um, Germans are very aware of that and very afraid of that. Um, This was this was a concern when DNA typing started in the late 1990s, 80s and then early 90s. And um, you just have to live through that. It's a new technique and everything, even your kitchen knife, uh, can be abused uh, for homicidal <laughs> or other reasons. So you really, as a society, you need time to develop the space in which the society feels comfortable. And if the society decides not to use it, then okay, then let's not use it. That happens. There are criminalistic techniques that are just not used and that's fine. I, so, and like this, what, for example? Uh, certain types of interrogation techniques or uh, lie detectors, many things. Uh, lie detectors, for example, they aren't bad at all. It's just that you can screw with them. It's not so much that you can screw with them not detecting the lie, but you can screw with them not detecting if you are not lying. That's the problem. So you don't have a baseline uh, comparison value. That's the problem. So this is why in many countries they are not allowed. In the Philippines, for example, they are used. I've seen that. Um, and yeah, let's let's leave it like this. There are, there would be more techniques. Okay, I can just mention briefly one thing. It's transfer DNA. That's a big topic uh, since two years. What We had cases before and we did experiments on that, but we did not realize that it would ever be uh, of any importance. For example, if you share a newspaper um, uh, because some people still um, get a newspaper, let's say in the morning, they read it and then they give it to their neighbor, mostly elderly people, obviously, because it's a printed paper newspaper. But let's say it could be a comic book <laughs> and that probably, it probably relates more to uh, scientific uh, people. And um, <laughs> that became a problem um, recently. When is it transfer DNA and when is it, is it an actual sign that the person whose DNA is now on the fingertip of the corpse did really touch the fingertip of the corpse uh -huh. or was it just somebody reading a comic book sharing with somebody else some and then the person who read the comic book afterwards touched the fingertip of the dead person so that's uh, that's the third thing that's transfer dna but how how do you how do you tell that what that seems by the amazing. level of dna you, we i'm i can, also, we did it uh, with experiments because we had a very often in criminalistics that is very good you can exclude one option and then you know that the other one must be correct because criminalistically you only have two options so the police knows that only two options are possible for example you have a camera outside of a building and the camera is filming just two people going in and out and 
all other windows and doors are really locked and you check that they were locked. So you know that there are only two people. So if you can exclude one person from whatever happened, then the other person must be the perpetrator to simplify it. I mean, and um, th that's, uh, that's what you can try to do. For example, mm, let's make it easy. Th that's a real case that we had. The person is dead in her apartment, a woman, and the neighbor's DNA is uh, in the shower of the woman. For some reason, they, they checked, they swapped uh, the, the, um, the little, I don't know how you call it. It's a, it's a plexiglass thing so that the water doesn't spill out of the, out of the shower. Well, well, I don't know, how do you call that? Not a shower curtain, a shower wall. <laughs> a shield. The... A shield, shower shield. Yeah, and, that, um, that's what you'd call it in German, right? It'd be like the, you know, that you'd say the Schirm or something. So, so probably i really i don't even know the german term <laughs> and um it's so um, they swapped that and then the lawyer called me and i was like okay it could be transfer if you are absolutely convinced that your client cannot have been there because the client said i haven't been there for weeks but i installed the the shower shield i did install the shower shield i helped my neighbor and that is a really a stupid uh, thing to say because everybody i mean that's childish you know you can always say yeah i don't know my sperm is there because um whilst my neighbor was on holiday and i had the key okay i admit it I, I, you know, I ejaculated in the empty apartment or something. You know, people always, always come up with it. It could be true, but you never know. So it's like, mm, I don't care. I'm the scientist, you know. Mm. But with the shower shield, I was like, huh, let's see. How do we bring this into the field of actual measurements of, of uh, assumption-free testing? And I was like, okay, maybe ask friends and family of the person how she cleaned herself how she washed herself because in germany most people shower at least once a day sometimes twice a day but but usually once a day and um the relative said that she didn't do that she didn't shower at all and i'm like okay maybe you can use that in the trial because if if the neighbor really helped her installing the shower shield and if it is true which i don't know i'm i'm not the person to decide that that she did not shower but only wash herself with a washing cloth or, or hardly uh, clean herself at all. I don't know. So he brought that into the trial. And so from there it, it went. So that would also be a case of transfer DNA in a very like sleeves up case. But that's an actual case I had. Hmm. The newspaper cases about, I also had. What about a uh, fingerprint? So uh how how well can you take fingerprints off uh, soft media? So, for example, clothing, or let's say, for example, someone was strangled. Could you could you take fingerprints off skin? Yes, it's possible. The um, the German Federal Agency for Police Investigations, w which would be kind of like the FBI, Bundeskriminalamt, um, the, and some uh, some institutes for legal medicine. Sometimes they have some people, friendly, nerdy checkerboard square pattern types who who work into that i know one of these guys from bundeskriminalamt and they often work on that problem and in many cases they manage to develop skin ridges i, I mentioned that uh, strange term before so so finger fingerprints from fingers not dna fingerprints uh, to to lift them or not, not to lift necessarily lift them but to make them visible on skin for example of a dead person it is possible the question again is like you were asking before um are there enough resources and is there enough trained personnel to do it no <laughs> for example let's say you find a corpse in the in the bushes somewhere and then the corpse is going to be transported to the Institute for Legal Medicine anyways. And nobody is going to try to lift off uh, skin ridges or to, to make them visible there in the shrubbery because um, it may start to rain. The press may start to show up. The um, coroners or forensic pathologists or the medical legal guys are like, hey, the light is super bad here. Can we please get the corpse onto our table where we have good light and can work properly? And then... All those types of evidence are sometimes lost. It just happens. You, that's unavoidable. Hmm. But it is possible. So what what kind of, how precise can you be? So say, for example, you were uh, using all the evidence you had was insects. Or you, you, what, how precise can you be in terms of, uh, you know, time of death? And is it down to the hour? Is it down to the day? Like, what, what, what are your powers? What are 
the with the power of the technique my power is only i like to sleep so i my, my main power is i can sleep wherever i am <laughs> that's my personal power um but uh The power of the technique is that if you do it properly in the sense that the knowledgeable colleagues understand what you did and you don't rely to, I do this for 30 years. If you don't trust me, you're an asshole. And I, not that. But if, if it's completely transparent, you give all your data, the raw data, Even, let's say, some people use assumptions. You openly state your assumptions in the expert witness statement. Everything. Transparent in the sense of glass clear transparent. No, nothing. Just glass clear. Then you can go down to the hour but, uh, concerning the in uh, colonization interval. I wouldn't call it time since death because sometimes people are frozen for a long time or s stored somewhere under conditions where insects cannot approach them. It is possible, for example, with the um, green bottle or blue bottle flies, the greenish uh, shiny metallic ones and the blue metallic ones. If you know your area and if you have good developmental data and if you if you are able to calculate the temperatures because the growth rate is temperature dependent, then you can go down to the hour in certain cases, let's say, You know from the blood stains and from cell phone data and from witness statements, probably which I don't like, <laughs> obviously. But um, if you if you have good criminalistic information, and then the the person is found in a garage and it's summertime in a city that you know and you know which animals live there and the garage is half open, then you probably get down to the hour. <laughs> if if the corpse is not wrapped in in uh, something that really prevents um pregnant blowflies to deposit egg patches or something but in the, in those cases you can get down to the hour i personally prefer something completely different there's a lot of hassle and and you know ach juridical proceedings going on in the united states about the question can we now work work it down to the hour yes or no wait my wife is coming in you're not coming in okay um But I, from the beginning, was more interested in the ecological system itself. So, f so what, what I personally prefer to do is, let's say you have a corpse wrapped in a carpet and that's thrown into a sea. That happens into a lake. It does happen. Um, I had cases like this. Then I look at all insects and I'm more like, okay, are you interested in, um, in a report about whatever I find? And then half of the police people would say, no. Biology and natural sciences are very boring. Go away. We don't want a long report, even if it is written in, in, in regular plain language. And the other half would say, especially more experienced homicide detectives, they would say, why are you asking that? And like, yeah, because there's more information apart from the possible um, colonization interval in here. For example, we could find information about during which season was the carpet wrapped and where. So we had a huge investigation about that because the question was, was the corpse ever at the edge of a forest? So a student had to, I don't know, many months, he uh, put out uh, dead piglets at the edge of the forest, outside of the forest and inside of the forest. And then with the help of many colleagues, I could not have done it. Nobody could have done it alone. The student also, he could not have done it alone. Um, they helped us from Museum König, which is a museum for natural sciences. And they had a colleague, uh, he's now in Canada. And um, also they had beetle experts and, you know, we're living on the planet of insects. So they, had, they have uh, experts for everything there. And we found that there was an amazing number of insects that were never even described as to being related to decomposing bodies for example some of the insects we found are just meeting there they just use it as an orientation point probably due to the smell or due to what it looks like in infra infrared or ultraviolet we don't know and um, from that we could tell that a witness state There was a witness who said, I saw a car at the edge of the forest and I found it strange that the car was there. 
And the police was like, oh God, a car at the edge of the forest. You know, it could be some people having sex there. It could be tourists, you know. We don't know if this is of relevance or not. Let's not begin to look for the, let's call it the yellow Fiat Panda car with the number sign with a seven in it. Let's not even start because first we, we want to know if this is of relevance or not. And now that we knew that the corpse was at the an edge of a forest and the composition of all insect matched the season and the edge of the forest situation they were like okay let's look for the stupid yellow fiat punto with the seven and the number plate because now it made sense for them so that's more what i like to do to to work more on the criminalistic but also on the ecological side of the cases is so so you can get locations orientations you can you can get some pretty detailed information yeah it's possible if you have a student uh, to to give you a six or 12 month of their lives for free but um it's nobody's going to pay that so uh, we are we are just totally yeah we, we just check if anybody uh, can do that or if anybody's going to fund that which never happens or if uh, if the students give their lifetime so uh, since you were asking i was saying i i live on subsist subsistence but the students live on on their parents money or whatever <laughs> i really have to stress that because many people think this is a nice job and you know it sounds very good but um it really depends on what uh, yeah What you're really interested in, if you if you like to measure and if this gives you peace and calm and I don't know, <laughs> uh, a, a good, nice content uh, for your personal life, then then you're at the right place. But if you are interested in, for example, um, getting a better job over the years, uh, getting promoted, getting more money, getting social security and so on, then you really, really forget it. Have you ever found an insect that no one knew about? Have you discovered any insects? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, um, one that's not an insect uh, is named after me. Uh, that was newly discovered, but it was very old, millions of years old. <laughs> that's named after me. Um, but I it? didn't discover it. Not an insect? What was it? Uh, it's, it's a certain type of one of these uh, bristle stars that are living in the ocean. That was uh, found by colleagues of mine when they were opening the stone uh, sediments from millions of years ago. And they just found fragments of an animal that they had never seen before. And then they described <laughs> it and named it after me because they were like, this is this is like what Mark does. He's he's like looking for stains in crime cases. And we look into stains that are, well, I don't know, 200 million years old. So they, you know, they made the connection. But uh, I did actually find a new species. But I didn't know um, it. That was also inside of a bottle of rum <laughs> again, and um, I gave the whole bottle of rum, a small bottle of Ron Medellin from from a Colombian uh, rum, which has a spider as a logo. It's my favorite rum. Every all the students know that, so I get a lot of that. <laughs> They give it to me. They're like I was Marquito, like small Mark, uh, or like tiny Mark, uh, or like huge Mark. <laughs> have another bottle of Ron Medellin. Okay, so there we go. So I have too many bottles and uh, I take them to put the insects sometimes inside if I'm in the field. And a colleague of mine, who, by the way, um, usually is never seen by anybody. He's never at a congress. He's probably the shyest person I ever saw. He's one of the invisible people. If he's going to die, nobody's going to know for the next two weeks. So, so I'm not talking only about drug addicts or people who are socioeconomically weak. Like I said, but also it can be a character trait. He's one of the people. The only thing he does is like have a, uh, his jars and his microscopes. And uh, the I, I think probably he's not even going to the supermarket, but probably he's ordering his food online or something. I'm not kidding. It's really possible. And he found that there were several um, insects that he didn't know. And since he's such a nerd, he found out that it's really new even for the um tropical region where where i collected the insects from a from a dead animal and um then he we made a deal because i mean i was the one who found it but i didn't know so i'm like okay you can do whatever you want you know give it whatever name you want so we named it after my colleague who was the head of the forensic training at that point in colombia marta wolf so it's it's named after her but at the same time um i told him you I will not be in the scientific paper, so you can take my name out, which is very unusual for scientists. You can probably imagine yeah. that this is a little bit unusual. But I said, but 
but the deal is you give me back the pieces of the insect. It was a very, very small insect. And um, I bring it back to where I found it and they can put it in their museum because I hate it. I hate it when, when, when researchers go to a place, take whatever they want, take the scientific credit or the economic credit or whatever, and then not cooperate with the people or the community to whom or to where it belongs. So I brought it back. And um, I was very surprised, very, very, very surprised. This was just a little slide, a glass slide, because he had to completely disassemble the insect into, you know, like legs and mm. sexual organs and wings and everything, very small. And um, I brought it back and I'm like, something is wrong here because it was like in a huge conference hall. Everything was like dark wood and so on and so on. And like, there are also many people here. I don't know because I know the students over the years. And then they're like, uh, okay, Mark, do you know, come, come to the stage. And I'm like, I'm not giving a speech right now. And then they made me, which is, you know, something very friendly, but um, um, honorary member of the Society of Biology in Peru. Uh, and and those were all these these people and I'm like okay but why because you know I'm just I didn't do anything and they're like yeah but you're the first person ever who brought back a newly discovered species to our um, to our museum of natural history I'm like okay wow I, that is not 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 uh, wow because of me but wow because of my colleagues. My colleagues are really idiots, really, if they if they store the stuff uh, at home and don't cooperate with with the locals there. And I'm not I, I don't mean like native locals or anything. I mean, like normal people like everybody else. So, you know, it's not like shrunken heads or something that you bring back and you, you make a burial and it happened 300 years ago. That's also a big topic. I also know people who do that. But I'm talking about absolutely normal behavior. I mean, I don't go into your kitchen, take a cup out of your cupboard without asking and just take that home. And then I'm like, yeah, I have a nice new cup. I discovered I mean, this. <laughs> yeah, I just exactly. Very good. I discovered it. It's mine. So I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> at the at the beginning uh, of our discussion, I asked you what sort of things give your work meaning, and uh, at the time you gave a particular answer. But now I'm I'm developing a better idea for <laughs> the sort of things that give uh, what you do meaning. Can I um can I ask? There's another question about technology and and uh, what you know the sort of the powers that uh, criminal investigators have um, in Germany in particular. What kind of access do does law enforcement have when it comes to our digital fingerprints? So, you know, I'm on the internet every day. Um, do the police, you know, do the police need warrants to get access to telephone data and and you know your Facebook and and emails and this sort of thing? How does how does that work out? I guess both in Germany and also in the U.S. and in other places in the West. Nah, no, it's very different in, in different countries, even if you go from Germany, because the neighboring countries would be Luxembourg, uh, Switzerland, Belgium, etc. It's uh, Hungary, um, Poland, um, so too much. Romania. Too much. And um, they are all very different, very, very different. For example, in Switzerland, people are like, okay, have all my data. Just don't share it with foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> like they, they, have, they have like they, it's called um, a Schweizer Bürger Akte. So so every person in Switzerland um, has a file in which data about the person are stored. If that would happen in Germany, there would be civil war at the, in, on the same evening. You know, <laughs> it would be impossible. And um, so in Germany, you always need a judge to give access to data, but it's mostly the companies uh, pushing back. For example, the huge uh, telecommunication uh, company that is also known in other parts of the world is Telekom. That's a German company. Mm -hmm. um, they they are very strict. They And they also don't allow... I mean, talk, I'm not talking about secret service here. I'm talking about police and law enforcement, like you said. They would not even allow you like uh, having a peep or something or, you know, just like, okay, don't tell anybody, but... You know, look at it. It's it's they are very very strict. Um, even if it comes to crime cases, I can give you an example. Okay. Oh wait, we have to make a quick break. J just one minute. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Hello. All good. <laughs> yes. And um, the second problem is, I, oh, no, I wouldn't call it a problem, but uh, it's a fact. You know, the companies are very strict due to um, yeah, it's it's a trust. 
matter um, because the customers are sometimes very sensitive, obviously, to the to data protection, which I understand. So um, that's the one thing. The other thing is that when it comes to organized crime, Germany is heaven for organized crime because you can launder and wash your money here uh, quite well. Um, 100 billion um, euros are, are, are getting washed and laundered uh, every year in Germany. And this is the latest uh, estimate from the German criminal police from from the, uh, i don't know two months ago or something so it's it's not uh, it's not something out of the cloud uh, can and i just ask sorry you're saying it's it's perfect because of data protection because people no no, no 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 that's the problem the data protection is good for customers who are who are a little bit afraid of their personal space but what happens at the same time is the data protection is too good Mm -hmm. um, so that organized crime can bloom in Germany very much when it comes to uh, money laundering. And the latest uh, Congress that uh, happened this year at the German criminal police w would really stress that not, not only um, concerning cr uh, cryptocurrencies and so on, but also just concerning the, the, a complete blind spot Uh, when it comes to money laundering in, in the large scale is sometimes weird because it would be relatively easy to use big data like phone data to check who's talking to whom or who is moving to where and then where are the nodes in, in time and space. Uh, but since that was used by the Eastern German Secret Service a lot, not with cellular phones, obviously, because they didn't exist then, but um, with, by yeah, just spionage and, and <laughs> invasion of personal space, um, Germans are very still very sensitive to this, and that's the downside. Mm. So the data protection is is firm juridically and uh, from the companies themselves, but at the same time the police is not equipped uh, very well. And especially when it comes to encryption, we like all countries um, we have the pedophilia uh, thing going on here in Germany, and whenever something blows up pedophilia wise then everybody's like totally surprised except of all of us because we are like i mean what did you expect every the data is so tightly protected of course uh, people uh, people will abuse that not only organized crime when it comes to money laundering drugs etc but also obviously when it comes to pedophilia and um, the other problem is that once in a while since the jobs at the police when it comes to uh, whatever you want to call it, data mining or, or <laughs> de-encryption and so on, or decryption are not sometimes not very attractive. For some people, yes, because they like like a 38.5 um, um, hour week, but for others not. Um, they, they're not. They don't always have access to enough personnel. And that can be a huge problem when it comes to like Matrix, like the movie series Matrix, when you have like different layers of um, not only encryption, but let's say you have social encryption, then computer encryption, then you have Tor networks uh, in between, um, you know, like the, like mingling with the IP addresses. And then you, let's have your cryptocurrency <laughs> under, under everything. And it would be relatively easy criminalistically to, uh, to get a grip on that. But Germans socially don't are not ready for that, In, and we had we had very bad cases, um, very nasty cases, uh, where everybody was like, "Ah shit, shouldn't we start to?" This is cases on uh, of pedophilia, or no, not only pedophilia, but also where like nasty data was stored under several layers by people who were supposed to work for law agencies. I see, and so I see. on. Mm. I see. I, 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 well, actually, I don't see. Is you mean that they were protecting certain people, or they themselves? The, no, 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 no. They, they, they actually did it. They were not just protecting somebody. They were they they managed illegal data. At the same time, being in a position where they were supposed to haunt uh, to to to, mm. to to find out who is doing that I, i don't want to go into the details but the persons who uh, who listen or who watch uh, will very easily google what i'm talking about it was very nasty i see i see i you mentioned earlier that you had spoken uh, directly to psychopaths and various people perpetrators of various crimes and this sort of thing 
Um, one thing I'm kind of curious about is, okay, for the individual case, maybe that was useful, but is is that useful more broadly? So for example, um, have, you, have you been able to speak to people where then it helps you later on uh, in forensic investigation of other crimes? Do you, do you learn anything to add to your toolbox? That's the only reason why I do it. In many cases, it's very interesting for the stains. For example, I had a killer who killed a lot of kids and um, there were always the, these, they don't exist much anymore. Formerly on beer bottles, you had like these little stars uh, with, with a lot of uh, stars, these, these, I don't know what it's called, Kronkorken in Germany. Uh, you know, the, the things that you lift off yep. uh, and then... Like the bottle tops. The bottle tops. And, and they were all from the same brand. And I was just curious and asking him. And he's like, uh, because I was drunk when I committed the crimes. And I'm like, uh huh continue and he's like yeah well it was not i mean my life is is not a good life you know i was beaten as a kid and i was sexually assaulted which is true i checked it with a sister and so on and so on of course i don't believe anybody like i said uh, not even me i just so I, I i triple check everything and he's like okay i was i was, I was just totally bumped and and uh, drunk uh, when i did that i'm like okay that is not uninteresting because I had another case, which was not my case because the offender was already dead, but it influenced me because it happened in my area where I grew up. And our parents were very strange for many years. They would always like, don't approach strangers. Don't take um, sweets from strangers. Um, never get close to a stranger. And we were like, okay, mom and dad. Okay, you know, calm down. We are just walking to school like two minutes. You know, how bad can it be? And that was a case where he, that was also a child killer. And he, um, I'm the one who, who resurrected the, the files from an archive and published the case. And I was like, wait a second, there's a brief remark that he was drunk. So I talked to a person who knew him personally for a long time. And I'm like, say, do you remember that this, that, because he was relatively young, he was caught when he was 19. He already, um, he already killed four kids and the fifth escaped. And then he was like, yeah. Yeah, he was drunk. And I'm like, yeah, but he was under super strict observation of his parents. His parents even took away his clothing so he could not get outside uh, at nighttime and so on and so on. How could, how could he become an alcoholic and drink so much at age 19 under strict supervision of his parents? And he's like, yeah, that's an interesting question. So I was like, uh-huh, maybe I have something there. So, you know, I, I was like, maybe the, the damage of the... La that makes these people not only a psychopathic because we have a lot of psychopathic people running around mm -hmm. being doctors or working at a bank or whatnot. I don't know. Um, but also, um, but they don't harm anybody in, in the criminal way. So how is that? And then maybe I was like, okay, maybe alcohol is just like an overseen extra that makes it more likely that a psychopathic person who also probably had a bad life, mm -hmm commits the crime because it lowers your your inhibitions and maybe it's just mm -hmm. one simple thing more it's not it's not super important and you don't have to write a publication about it or something but you know let's keep it in mind and next time you can ask about that for example because sometimes when the offenders say they don't remember and you know very clearly that they did it then the police is like jesus fucking christ he he confesses to 80 murders, but not to the five ones that are left. What should we tell those five families? We know exactly he did it, but those five families will forever be in like eternal limbo and never know who did it because the motherfucker is not um, just confessing these five crimes. And then I could, for example, say, yeah, but maybe he was so drunk that he really doesn't remember. Maybe he's not making it up to, to annoy anybody. Um, but And, you know, that puts a lot of pressure often out of whatever is going on, discussions and so on. So that's the one thing. And the other thing is, in um, I was not aware of the amount of neglect that happened to people in prison. Le let's put it like this. Um, sometimes I give interviews for newspapers in prisons because um, some prisons do that as a little project. So the people, you know, the, the offenders can do something in their spare time <laughs> and so on and so on. And sometimes I even give talks to them, obviously not about stains. <laughs> it's maybe not the best idea about stain collection, but about things that they are interested. Very, very rough guys sometimes, you know. The, for example, the guys with, with the red training suit in Germany, the, the training jumper suit, they're, usually they're very high in the hierarchy and so on. And you're like, okay. But also others, uh, females, 
That's also very interesting. Females that come to you, look totally normal, you know, like, like also from the behavior, very relaxed. And then, of course, you don't ask because sometimes they tell, sometimes not, but they find that a boring topic. But sometimes they tell you and they're like, yeah, I have six years. And I'm like, okay, six years in Germany, that must have been something. <laughs> you know? And uh, it's, so I talk to them and the amount of ne of neglect in their childhood That was really something that completely flashed me. And that came from interviews with offenders because the offenders were all, some of them just mentioning it as if that was something completely normal. You know, you know, <laughs> like I, I don't, I don't want to give examples, but people can probably imagine what I'm talking about. And then you go to the prison and that's good because then you're not surprised anymore where, because for, for all of them, that's, that's something completely normal violence in families. It's like, huh? didn't that happen in your family? Uh, you know, like, Isn't that normal? They don't know, even if they are in prison for 10 years. It's, they never heard of, of a friendly, a loving, a caring environment. For them, that's something out of a fairy tale movie or something. They really, really, really never experienced that. And I cannot change that. But let's say I talk to psychiatrists, to psych psychologists, or at any type of mixed congress, then it's always good that we have a basic understanding of that. Because I'm the sane person, there is the social worker, whatever, psychologist, psychiatrist, and so on. And, you know, we don't have to discuss that anymore. We're like, okay, we all know that this is a common denominator in, in many of those cases. So now let's talk about something that, like gives us a new information that that is really interesting for a congress and let's not switch back to something that is known for now 150 years and we all know it from our daily experience so it helps us to focus on the relevant new um information that comes out of a out of a case that makes me wonder about your opinion on something so what what do you think the treatment of people who are psychopathic and violent say uh should be like should should they be held responsible for their crimes or should they be viewed as uh sick people who need treatment because as you mentioned you know the, certain people that you've spoken to who have committed horrendous crimes may have may have grown up being abused that they, they may be damaged in 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 ways that we can't imagine as people who have grown up with loving families and this sort of thing what's your view in, in that direction Um, I speak a lot to psychiatrists and psychologists. Um, usually I contribute to uh, paranormal cases or like uh, when people think that insects are... Right now I have a case that also came in yesterday, which is probably interesting for... Um, for some of you, because today is uh, Christmas Day. So yesterday was also Christmas Day. So the cases are also coming in on Christmas Day and I'm really working all, all the time. I, I was not making that up. Um, and the person says, okay, we, ha we had a, f a kind of a small flooding, not the huge uh, catastrophical flooding, but just a small flooding somewhere. And since then, I see wasps moving strangely. And now as a biologist, I would say, well, it's winter and the wasps are dying. So, you know, that's, but she's convinced that something paranormal is coming. So, so I work with those people and I'm not at a psychiatric or psychological congress talking about the psychological psychiatric side, but only about the stain side, because many of the psychiatrists and psychologists have no idea that the stains exist. So yes, these people are psychotic, but n the stains are still there. So it's not, most psychologists, psychiatrists think the stains are also not there, which is not the case. The stains are, in most cases, are there. Also, a surveillance. You know, when people come and say, um, cameras are filming me all the time, then we're like, yes, you're right. Cameras are filming you all the time. That is correct, because in public space and in the subway, there are cameras. Which cameras are you talking about? And then like, no, it's a tiny invisible camera in my lamp. And then we are like, okay, those cameras exist. Let's examine your lamp. You know, and the psychiatrist would say there are no tiny invisible miniature cameras in lamps, which is absolutely not true. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to every spy shop on planet Earth and buy them for like $50, you know. So, okay. So we are checking the actual case. So now, so of course, in many cases, they are talking about criminal things because being forensic scientists, we are, I'm also at forensic congresses. And I would say the, The only solution as a, as societies on planet Earth that we have now in the year 2000, winter 2021 is 
the people who are psychopathic be also because they are narcissistic that's a big problem with the with the psychopathic people one of the big problems and they're also antisocial um these are three or two things that once mingled together or brought together become a third thing psychopathy um you cannot cure that and when you talk to the offenders and if they speak openly which happens which does happen um, because uh, they, they can be very friendly very straight very open once they think th uh, you talk on the same level with them which i do so you can talk very openly to them uh, sometimes they even commit uh, to crimes of which they know that they can never be proven i also had that case with a female psychopathic killer very interesting she commit she confessed everything in a in a in a way that that would never lead to conviction she knew that because the stains were not there um those you cannot cure right now maybe probably later now when it comes to to the sexual things that become criminal for example pedophilia like we were talking about that before that depends on the country of course some people have completely different concepts but when we're talking about like western world as as we imagine it to exist um the best is to go completely into prevention in germany we have a program that's called kein Täter werden. don't become an offender at um, in berlin in hanover in many cities usually at university hospitals that works very well those people cannot say that they ever committed a pedophiliac um, offense because then this would have been reported would have to be reported so they they must not state that which of course is now a problem of uh, mm -hmm. a bias problem but on the long term it helps the colleagues of course to understand that and uh, how to prevent that for example one mode of prevention is to bring people who do not want to become pedophiliac um, offenders to not to just be around kids or juveniles sounds very stupid and simple but that is one of 1000 ways to to do that as in you separate Then, them you separate yeah, them right? yeah they they separate from situations they don't become a soccer trainer they don't become a priest they don't become you know all those risk groups and then for the people who are just neglected it can become very sticky and i will i will stop with that because this is of course a, a bigger topic I, again, that's a very recent case. I got a long, long, long letter from a person who's imprisoned and um, I, I helped them a little bit with, with, you know, like things that they did, like sent them books for the library and stuff like that. And for their, also, they also have a newspaper, a prison newspaper and so on. And he's like, my psychiatrist told me because he is in an institution where he has access to uh, psychological and psychiatric treatment. Not most don't most of the offenders don't want that, by the way, because it's too painful for them to talk about their childhood. That is something that many people don't know. Most of the offenders absolutely have not the slightest interest in talking to psychologists and psychiatrists in the true sense of the meaning. Also, not to talk about the offense because it's too painful for them because they they traumatized themselves and were traumatized as kids, which which people forget who tend to say, well, if we had enough uh, psychiatrists social workers psych psychologists in the prisons that would solve the problem well no it wouldn't because a, a very huge proportion of offenders doesn't do, they are not straight to themselves and then of course they are not straight to to the personnel that could help them but those who want help they are very often caught in sticky loops and sticky circles uh, circles for example this guy he writes me a long long letter and uh, he, he the system is corrupted he could write a, a large book about a huge book about that and i told him write your book but do one thing you must openly state what you did because you're writing me pages and pages of uh, how the system is corrupted and your life mm -hmm. is fucked and everything but if you want to write an interesting book about your life you you must include exactly what you did because if not nobody knows what you did and then the book is just boring because mm -hmm. if you just ramble and ramble and ramble about society then that's you can have that at every pub at, at, at every corner they don't need people don't need to read your book okay and i, and I suppose also if you don't admit respond if you don't accept responsibility for what you've exactly. done how can anyone else be expected and to? that's 
Exactly, and that is the sticky loop. So now, okay, he knows that he cannot always blame society. He learned that during psychotherapy or social work or whatever. So he learned that, but he doesn't fully wrap around the problem that this is just an excuse for what he did. And not only an excuse, probably also the reason. Okay, so the next step is he needs to get earlier out of prison, he needs to get into an environment where he's a little bit controlled by social workers. So they see if he's starting to take drugs again or behave erratically and so on. But also at the same time, if he has a problem, he can talk to somebody. So he needs an environment for that. So now he starts to talk to me if I have an environment that is good for him. And that is that is now red alarm flag because this question doesn't make sense because structurally there is enough help in prison. So why is he asking me? So he continued to write me letters and so on. And the reason is, The, his sticky loop is, since childhood, he always tries to attach himself to somebody else and to, to melt together with another person so he doesn't have responsibility for anything, for cleaning the room, for taking care of his job decisions, and so on and so on. And this is probably how the crime happened. Probably a partner of him told him, okay, I'm sorry, I like you, but I don't love you. So we cannot live together. And then, you know, it's a screw mm -hmm. uh, is getting loose. That's something that we experience a lot. And then they just kill the partner. Um, and that's, and so I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm the stain man and I help you with your prison newspaper, but I am 100% not helping you to find an environment because he's asking me if it's close to me, if I know a good environment close to our laboratory. And that is, that is totally appropriate and proves that he's again trying to attach himself socially to somebody he knows and the whole problematic circle starts again. So this is the reason why cases is, can And that's be... also terrifying for you. No, 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 we are used to that. Oh, death threats and, and uh, stalking and, oh no... And organized crime, we are used to that. That's not a problem. If you are frightened of that, you cannot work in my job. <laughs> uh, is this because uh, there there are people who don't want you to get involved in in certain criminal investigations, or um, no? It's mostly they want you to get involved and work on their side, and then we explain them we don't work sides. I'm not. I never in my life worked on any side, not even for my parents. You know, like I'm like I'm on, I'm on no side ever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that then causes sometimes uh, pressure but i suppose i suppose actually you're it's more dangerous for you if you ever one time uh sort of I, i imagine if you do one favor for someone or you you bend a little bit then things start to get really squirrely mm, i'm not sure because sometimes they are very specific on a particular case for example um, let's say two guys from the classical motorcycle gang, they exist, yeah. Get, uh, one guy from a motorcycle shoots the other guy straight from, whilst he's driving from his motorcycle and steals his um, jacket, which is super valuable. The jacket is the most valuable thing on planet Earth for them. So, um, real actual case. And then they are sometimes very specific of, of what they want from you. Which, which type of evidence you are supposed to work on. So I'm not sure that if you, I, I wouldn't call it a, a favor because I, n I never give favors to anybody. But um, if you work for them, that might be enough. Then they would say, okay, he did his job. We, we don't care about him anymore. So I'm not so sure if you get really um, into a vicious circle with, or like, like a sticky situation with them, but I still don't do it. Because because I'm too I'm too blunt and too I don't know yeah blunt <laughs> for that I just I'm like no I'm not working for anybody except uh, except objective truth hmm. that that yes but not justice not you not grandma no at the this is this this is no segue into the next topic but uh, just out of curiosity one of the big cases that's currently in the news and people are currently interested in is, is this Epstein case in the States. I know you were in Manhattan. And I, I just wanted to ask um, uh, so that I can understand one aspect of this case, which is, so people are wondering about whether it was suicide or whether he was murdered, say. And one thing that people focus in on is this bone that was broken. Uh, 
are you able to uh, sort of flesh out why that's important, that particular broken bone and, and what you can tell from that? In general terms, when people die in prison, there's often a suspicion of foul play uh, going on. And, you know, it's, it does happen. If you talk a lot to prisoners, there's a lot of shitty stuff, including uh, violence, rape, um, self-made weapons that are around drugs of course that is really even in industrialized super civilized countries i'm not even talking about united states where like a huge proportion of the population is in prison anyways and that obviously causes problems but even in in countries like austria um, the small country in europe or, or germany or switzerland and so on you always have that in prison. there's no place to better get access to criminal structures, to drugs and everything uh, than in prison. The best way to get access to that is go to prison and then you have your network and your drugs. So, and, and the, so therefore you never know what happened in the prison cell, or, except you have a camera, a camera rolling. Um, the problem with broken bones, with black eyes, skin lacerations, anything is always that you never know if something was traded inside of the prison of which you don't know and it seems as if it was violence homicidal violence or you know foul play violence that is related to what you think is going on for example in the Epstein, Epstein case so one manner of trade in all prisons is sex but they don't talk about it because if you are the young sweet guy and you are protected by the by the crime lord then probably none of them socially is going is ever going to say that this is a sexual relationship and not just the protection relationship out of business reasons so let's say they have rough sex then anything is possible because, you know, you, you don't know how rough it gets. And then you can have black eyes and probably even a broken rib or anything because the power, uh, the, the element Dynamic. of power here is, is not only inside of that relationship, but it also relates to the complete prison population who's supposed to know or not to know something and also to the personnel, to the staff and even to the Ministry of Justice or whoever might be, you know, involved in a, in a particular case or to the, to the government. So that's the problem in uh, prisons. So whenever we see a person burned in a prison cell, we would have to say, well, it's a known manner to get out of the prison cell to just find a way to to get a spark um, and to to burn your mattress that that is very well known to get a prison riot to get the fire alarm going to just have a little bit of unrest because you're bored out of totally different reasons because the drug deal is going on in the other part of the prison and you're supposed to just you know burn your mattress so that all the attention is focused on your on your stupid mattress and it can, it but if you die due to the smoke in due to smoke inhalation from that mattress and it is a case that is of public interest then of course everybody's going to say well we think that somebody burned him in the prison cell which is absolutely possible but how to distinguish that and the same is true for broken bones black eyes even strangulations you never know because we know that autoerotically people sometimes strangle themselves we see that a lot this this is not a rare occurrence at all now, let's say there are two guys in a prison cell and they have the agreement. Okay, you do whatever you want. You know, you can, you can masturbate hanging like in the rope. I don't care. And I masturbate like with my self-made um, cardboard banana vagina. Okay, you know, it's just like, let, I don't care. We are here for the next two or three years together in that, in the stupid cell. This is really the least of our concerns, you know, the, the, the method of masturbation or sexual activity. Or probably they did it together. And so on. Now, let's say something goes wrong and the person dies in the um, strangulation <laughs> device and the other person was asleep. And so on and so on. So you never, you never know. The, the main problem in those cases is, do we have a trust, trustworthy statement? And in most cases, even if there was somebody there, even if guards were there, even if you have a camera running out in the floor somewhere in many cases the tr the non-trustworthy statement that you try to weave into a web of space and time criminalistically 
is based on the completely wrong assumption that let's say those two guys didn't like each other, those two guys were from a different gang, those two guys would never have sex, those two people would never smash, smash each other's skull against the wall during sex, nobody would ever use a strangulation device during masturbation and so on and so on. I could go on with like 1000 examples for that and that's mm -hmm. the problem when you have the dead people in prison. Mm -hmm. So, So basically you're saying in this particular case, especially for someone who has no experience at all in the criminal justice system to, to make assumptions about, you know, was this suicide? Was this based on hearing that a particular bone was broken? It's, 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 it's not scientifically sound. Let's put it that way. It depends. Um, if you if you have a very straight information, very reliable information, let's say, I would be called in as the guy that I am. Like, you no, know, everything, everything is screwed. Let's go to Mark because, you know, he takes the, the weird and, and useless cases. And, um, wait, yeah, I, I just checked if, uh, if the microphone is still running. Um, and in those, in, if I would get the impression that everybody's cooperating in the, uh, cooperating in the prison, let's say the prisoners are interested to tell the truth about the social networks that are really going on, which is very unlikely that they're going to tell you, but I would give it a shot. The guards are telling you the truth because in many cases, the guards are the ones who are smuggling the drugs in, into the prison. I mean, where do all the cell phones come from? In in prisons, you have, you, I don't know, you, <laughs> if you want to buy drugs, like I said, but also cell phones inside of a prison, then um, you just go ahead and, and then you just go ahead and find one. And this is smuggled in... Um, so if I would have access to full disclosure information so that time and space are clear, then you you could start to work in and massage in or or to <laughs> to to usefully apply whatever you find stain wise textile fibers, skin flakes, broken bones on the side of forensic pathology or medical legal. I wouldn't do this. This would be done by the medical doctors and then we could all sit together and openly talk it sometimes happens i had cases like this very high profile cases um, with international like implications in which it just happened because the lawyers understood that this that was the only way to ever uh, proceed uh, usefully but um, in most cases some some of the information is just isn't there and then you can work the stains but Usually I tell the people, um, I fear that whatever information will come out will not be enough for you because you are not asking about skin flakes, smoke, fire, bones, sperm, saliva, insect, hair. But what you're really asking is, did justice take place? Mm -hmm. And I'm the wrong person to answer that question. If you are still interested in the stains, we can go ahead, but please sign the statement that you understood what we do and you understand what we are not doing. We really do that. Very German. We, we really write a page and on that page, they really have to sign that there's full disclosure. We talked about it very often. I ask the lawyers to do that. So because private people sometimes are so emotional that they don't understand what they are signing. And then I also um, make the lawyer, their lawyer sign that their client understood what's going on. So that's the problem in the prison cases. In the interest of time and the that we have to wrap up, I want to just very quickly ask you one very final question. And that is, in the time that you have, um, if you could make a change to the criminal justice system, uh, what would it be to improve the way things run? And where do you think the future of forensic uh, science is going from here? Very, very quickly, if you're able yeah, yeah, to. Yeah, I can uh, do that quickly. Yeah. Uh, n number one would be have centers in every middle and large city in which a mixture of, in the United States, forensic pathologists or in other countries, coroners or, you know, the, the medical legal guys, the, the medical people who know about um, skin lividities, cuts, drowning, poison, the chemical people. And, you know, where you just have a center and this center is exclusively for the public. It is not a center for the police. It is not a center for the state. It's not a center for the court. It is not um, at all 
attached to the question of if a case is likely or reasonable or interesting for the public. Just have a center where people can talk. Not too long, not too short. Maybe you also uh, charge a nominal fee um, depending on probably the income of the people or you maybe, I think that could even be paid by tax money. It's not even very expensive. And then you check if enough information is there to follow the case. If there's not enough information, then you would tell the people, okay, I understand what you're saying, but there is not enough information. So you would you have to live with that. We know it's nasty. We know it's sad. We know it's fucked up. But if we don't have the information, we are not the persons you need to talk to. You have to deal with that on a spiritual level, on a um, anger management level or on a, any other level, on a trauma level. But stain wise and, and medical legal wise and uh, toxicology wise that you just don't have anything. So but in many cases, we know that there is something. So that would be my wish, which would very this could very easily be done. It This is absolutely in the range of money and time and everything. It would be very easy. It is just not being done because then you would see much more crime. And politically, that's very bad because let's say I'm the politician to install such an institution. Then during my time as a politician, I would have a, raise, a, a huge raise in crime because the crime is detected now. And that obviously no politician wants that. I mean, I, I, I would not be afraid as a politician to do that. But for some reason that I don't understand, um, I've never seen that in any country. Except, by the way, uh, Giuliani, for example, the, the much hated uh, Trump guy, he obviously I don't like him as a person, but um, he, uh, for example, was not afraid of that. He, he said, okay, if we have that many sexual assaults, then let's deal with the sexual assaults. So, you know, he, it's like in the Lord of the Rings, the most unexpected person did, <laughs> did the thing that nobody else dares, you know, like Frodo throwing or, or trying to throw the ring into Mount Doom. And uh, really, I mean it. I, I mean it. That was, that was Giuliani. Um, And the second thing, the next big thing that that's probably related to the technical questions we were talking about, the DNA and big da big data. I think that, that that's if society doesn't break down due to the ecological problems that we have, and we also talked about, then probably we could make a big step into the direction of responsible, reasonable, useful, social, friendly, um, good use of big data um, right now that's impossible because um, the control is not good enough but the day could come that would be in my opinion the next big thing mark banneke thank you for coming on the podcast <laughs> it, it's a pleasure it's uh, it's very nice to to you know reflect upon um your own work it's that's it's it's a good feeling i can well, recommend everybody to join your podcast dear scientists dear fellow scientists join this podcast it is, it is a good feeling <laughs> well thank you very much and you personally are welcome back anytime so thank you very much there we go okay it's a pleasure escaped sapiens thanks for watching if you enjoyed that you should consider subscribing to my channel And if you want to see the first part of the conversation, where we talk about how wealth influences the criminal justice system and what training looks like for budding crime scene investigators, then you should check out this link to Mark's channel. Cheers.